for uh, attending and, and inviting me to speak here at uh, uh, WordCamp Atlanta. It's a pleasure to be back on the campus of Kansas State University. Sorry, I just went right into it. I didn't even need to stop for the intro. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, hello, my name is Josh. Um, I've been extremely online since 1999 um, and uh, have been building the internet for my career uh, for almost going on 25 years now. Um, so I compiled my first, uh, I picked 1999 because I was, I'd done things online before, but it was more in like the BBS sort of like online forum era. That was when I started actually making the internet. So I compiled my first open source web stack, which was the Solaris Apache Perl Postgres stack, the SAP stack, which didn't have the longevity uh, of the technology that, that we all are here to talk about. But it was interesting and it was, it was, it was uh, somewhat uh, close to what we work with today. Um, my career took a tremendous turn in 2003 when I got involved in a, a presidential campaign um, there was a, a guy, uh, governor of Vermont, who was running in the primary, and he was a, a you know, one percent in the polls, sort of uh, 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 also ran candidate, but he figured out how to use the internet to organize people, communicate, and raise money, and actually came very close to winning. Um, and I had gotten involved in that campaign because I liked his message, um, and I had these internet skills, so like I could do more for then like show up and like collect signatures and so forth. So I got involved with like a group of open source volunteer type folks that were working around that campaign to develop software and technology for the campaign to use. And it was like a completely thrilling experience because you could see the way in which what we were able to do online really did matter in the real world and really could potentially have this, from my perspective, tremendously positive impact. Um, and for those of you who know about it, the campaign was actually a rather spectacular failure. It crashed and burned and was kind of heartbreaking. Um, but nobody who I worked with on that uh, project went back to their old life. Like you could not unsee what you had seen. And so, you know, um, I, uh, I got a lot more serious about the work that we were doing. I started a digital agency with some friends in San Francisco called Chapter 3. We were mostly working with Drupal as a technology, uh, but building uh, on the concept of open source and open web. And in, through the course of that consulting experience, um, we ended up working with a lot of large scale organizations on larger scale web projects. And while the customers, the clients were different, the projects were different, the websites were very different, there was a, a certain amount of work we had to kind of do up front to put, in, put ourselves in place a way of working together and also a way to launch the website that would scale and handle lots of traffic that was really just getting incrementally revised from project to project to project. And we took a step back and we realized that, hey, that could be a project, that could be a product in its own right. We could like turn our expertise into something we deliver as a service. Uh, and we started a company called Pantheon that um, was uh, uh, trying to do that. And I still work at Pantheon today, 13 years later. Um, it was still very Drupal oriented, um, but what we did was we allowed people to use uh, version control to keep track of the changes that were going on in their code. In their code, We allowed multiple developers to work in parallel without stepping on each other's toes. I'm gonna get a little feedback. All right, I'll just keep going and you'll, you'll dial me in. Um, multiple developers to work in, and, and also designers and content creators to work in parallel without stepping on each other's toes. And a, and a really like kind of push button way to bring all the work in progress together and safely release it onto the production website without there being any downtime or hiccups or, or issues. And uh, you know, that was what we used to do at pr a pretty pricey rate for these large scale com uh, cu customers. Um, you know, on a one by one bespoke basis. And we were able to package that up into a, a, a software as a service kind of offering with Pantheon. Um, and, uh, and pretty quickly we got, you know, a lot of adoption. Um, we had a lot of people like our former selves who are agencies and they loved our product and they kept coming, coming to us and say like, guys, your stuff is great. You have to support WordPress because I, that's like half my business and, and like I wanna use you for everything. And so, you know, obviously we knew about WordPress. I had a WordPress blog uh, back in the 2003 kind of era of my uh, ca uh, career. And, uh, and so we looked at it and we're like, yeah, this is a very similar kind of application, LAMP stack, uh, et cetera. We'll have to like make some minor adjustments. We can basically build the ability to, to run these websites uh, on our platform as well. And so that made perfect sense and, and we did. Um, and you know, 
we kept going and going and going. And as of you know, a couple of years back, we crossed the threshold of our platforms uh, delivering websites to over a billion monthly unique visitors. Um, we run a lot of websites, and a lot of them are large. So they're, uh, uh, it's, it's been quite a journey. Uh, and as part of that journey, I've been really, really blessed to get to know the WordPress community, um, you know, starting a little bit before that, that 2014 uh, date. And, uh, and I've seen the way in which some of these larger scale organizations are able to adopt and get value out of WordPress. And I wanna talk about that uh, in the community because it's a little bit different than, than how others might be getting value out of WordPress. And I think it's a good thing for people to know about and, and be cognizant of. I was just sitting down in the um, WordPress in Education and they're talking about how WordPress is kind of being adopted within the Georgia Department of Education. And it's, a, it's exactly this story. It's really exciting to see it happening all over the place. So, um, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, but so first I wanna actually just frame this, like why should we care about larger organizations, right? You know, um, I, I know uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a cultural um, uh, friction between open source communities and, and corporate uh, environments. Uh, and sometimes that can lead, on, on, in both, on, in, from both sides can lead to a little bit of like a, a people giving each other side eye. But I think um, one of the things that's, that's really crucial um, with, within the realm of open source and open source community is like a sustainable community is usually part of an ecosystem that it contains an economy. Because while a lot of us are hobbyists and enthusiasts, those of us who professionalize eventually, that professional commitment to continuing to work on a project gives it longevity. Uh, that if it's just purely people doing it on volunteer time, it, it won't necessarily have. And larger organizations can make long-term investments in keeping projects going, keeping people employed, and, and you know, so supporting the long-term health of that commercial ecosystem. Um, the other thing um, is sometimes in these larger organizations, you'll have access to technical innovation or technology or, or skills or, or, or uh, research and development organizations that you just wouldn't get from smaller actors. Right? Like if IBM starts working with a certain technology, they're gonna bring something to the table in doing that, um, which is just different in, it necessarily is different than what you would get from a lot of uh, individuals adopting it for themselves. And there's, there's stuff to be gained there. Um, and, and finally, the core mission of WordPress to democratize publishing is an incredibly vital mission within larger organizations. Like I don't know how many of you have worked or, or worked with people in big companies uh, but particularly if you're in a larger organization that's been around for 20 or 30 years, like they already have a bunch of web stuff because the web has existed that long. And I guarantee you that web stuff, if it's, it's probably not WordPress, uh, and it's probably pretty bad. And, and that mission of democratizing publishing, it, that's for everyone. Like people who work at big companies deserve to have good publishing tools too. So that's my pitch for why the WordPress community should feel good about getting more tightly ingrained with larger organizations. Um, now, why do large organizations care about WordPress? Well, picking up on what I just said, the ability to adopt a modern, easy to use, widely supported, um, uh, cost-effective technology to revitalize their web interface is a tremendous win for these organizations across many fronts. Um, there are a lot of larger organizations. You know, we're not talking about fresh new startups here. We're talking about um, bigger institutions, uh, larger companies and so forth. They have had web stuff for 20, 25, sometimes 30 years, but what they need from the web is changing because it doesn't matter whether you're thinking about constituent services or you're trying to like uh, uh, keep your customers loyal or you're trying to grow your business. The touch points companies have with people are now almost 100% digitally mediated. And when companies communicate with individuals, they're usually increasingly doing so with the idea of someone taking action. They're not just trying to get them to look at an image or, well, they are, right? People do advertising and billboards have a place in the world. But increasingly, the communication between companies and, and the people out there or inside the companies are ones that are, uh, have an action associated with them. There's a call to action in marketing speak. And calls to action are clicks, and clicks go to the web, and if the web is this legacy, lumbering, not usable, off-brand 
it, dysfunctional behemoth, it's very, very hard to get anything done. And so if you think about the, 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 the work of any of these personas, you know, designers, content editors, marketers, people, even people in IT, right, if they're dragging legacy technology behind them, it's very hard for them to succeed at their jobs. And if they're not succeeding at their jobs, the organization will fail at its mission. So large organizations um, care about WordPress because it can, in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, be a way for them to get out of decades of technical debt and establish a fresh start on the web at a time when the web is an increasingly vital asset for them to achieve their mission. Because if you, have to, if you want to win online, you have to move fast. Um, you have all these other things that are driving engagement, like I was talking about before. And it's not just digital engagement. I mean, who, anybody here watch the Super Bowl? Because like every other ad had a, if it didn't have a QR code, it had a, like a, a web URL where they're like, they were like, go type this into your phone right now. It wasn't like branding, like AOL.com is there. It was go to uh, you know, company.com slash Super Bowl to claim your free trial. Like, because every, they know I'm watching TV and I've got this device and I can do two things at once. And so if the thing that you're trying to drive people to, and increasingly it is with this device, is not up to speed, it's out of step, you're gonna be wasting all that, that Super Bowl money. And nobody wants to waste the Super Bowl money because it's a lot, it's not cheap. Um, the speed at which people can move though is just, it's, it's really not there. Like again, um, we commissioned some independent research on this uh, at, at Pantheon last year, as surveying over 450 um, uh, leaders in, uh, in corporate marketing IT. And over 80% of people reported that it took them a week or more to make a change to their website. Now, this is not just because of technology. Like the challenges usually are people, process, and technology. So in many cases, this is uh, because there's a process around making changes to the web, which dates back to a concept of the web as like your, your company's website is like the crown jewel of your brand empire. And you build it once with like the most amazing design firm with guys with just the hippest glasses you've, uh, you've ever seen. Um, and they, they get it perfect and it's beautiful and it's there and you would never move a pixel on that website without going through seven layers of approval. Um, that was how a lot of larger organizations conceived of their web presence not that long ago. Some probably still do today. I mean, I remember at a, a, at a, uh, a really interesting conversation with a, a really hip guy um, in Oakland at uh, Huge, which is a big global digital agency. Um, and I was trying to talk to him about the way that I work on the web, and he was like, this is really cool, but I don't know if there's much for us to do together because I work for Toyota, and Toyota's website, toyota.com, is a masterpiece that will never be touched until it is entirely reconceived. Uh, and like, that's how they, they, they think about it. Well, and, and, and in fairness, like at the, at the time, this was like in 2015 too, so they're not really wrong. Right, because Toyota.com is not where you go to buy a car, it's where you go to learn uh, the story of Toyota, the brand. And you know, um, uh, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the reason for this slowness is there is like, you know, in some cases, I actually think for the Toyota.com, I asked him, there is no CMS. It's all, it was just static HTML at the end of the day, what they produced. Uh, because again, it was like, a, a, it was a perfectly delivered artifact. Um, so you know, so that's, that's both, people, process, and technology. In some cases, you just, just have bad technology. It, it could be bad, like really poorly implemented WordPress. Like we've all seen it, right? Like I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but we've all seen those builds that are like, okay, so I need to post some content. Oh, let's, let's, you know, if you, like in, in organizations that have one of those kind of wonky idiosyncratic CMS implementations, there's like, one or two people that actually know how it works and they're busy with like 17 other things too. So it just kind of goes into a queue and when they get to it, they get to it. Or like this is like, you know, older enterprise uh, CMSs like Vignette and so forth have this problem in spades where it's like, we file a ticket with IT to change the copy. Um, and then there's other cases where it, it actually really is like, you know, just like teams are out of line. Like people will just bicker about what change to make. And like the technology's not in the way, they could do it anytime they wanted to, but they can't get on the same page. Regardless, this is not a recipe for success given everything we just talked about, about the, the, the importance of velocity. And yet it's something that a lot of 
uh, large organizations have just kind of like, they've gotten beaten into submission on this. There's a kind of a Stockholm syndrome that takes on, uh, takes, takes hold when it comes to the web where people are so used to it being just lagging behind and ah, oh, kind of broken and uh, we'll get to it next year. Um, you know, and I think the, uh, the increasing awareness, especially in these enterprise organizations, that there is a better way that you could really democratize publishing and it would be a good thing to do is, uh, is important. I think it's gonna actually make a lot of people not just more successful, but a lot happier. Um, and there's a, a specific kind of tension that comes into play with a lot of this stuff uh, in large organizations. Um, and this is where you get into like the classic, I, I'm gonna oversimplify for the sake, sake, sake of drama and narrative, but it's the classic conflict between marketing and IT, where you know, the IT people in an organization, they have imperatives around stability, security, compliance, that are non-negotiable, right? You, you cannot say, well, <laughs> we're just gonna run something insecure because we need to, because you're not gonna win that argument. But on the flip side, the traditional ways in which IT has usually gone about achieving those imperatives leaves the, the people on, the, on, the, on, the, on their, their partners on the business side, often in marketing, kind of hamstrung, right? They cannot, they cannot move fast. Maybe they have one of these systems where they can't even self-publish. Um, they, they, the, the practice of modern digital marketing has, is unrecognizable today compared to where it was a decade ago. There are so many new te technologies, so many new channels, so many new touch points. And, and the people on that side of the fence are often, you know, again, they have like one hand tied behind their back because they're like, oh, I can't use that. Oh, I can't use that because if, if I want to even pick that up, it's a two-year procurement cycle or this over here will never, I don't even, they're just going to shut me down. And, and it actually can result in a very unhealthy dynamic. Um, you know, large organizations inevitably contain politics. It's not possible to have like hundreds of people working together month over month, year over year without like groups to emerge that have opinions about one another. It, it's just, we're, we're, this is how we're wired as a species. You're not going to be able to solve it. Um, and and the, this, this dynamic can often like lead to like a pretty toxic environment. Um, and so again, like I think it's a great thing for us to think about how uh, open source technology like WordPress can actually come in and be a chance to reset this relationship. Um, so we did some more research that I wanna share with you um, and, then, um, uh, and then I'm happy to take some, some questions. Um, uh, this was an, an additional, so uh, the first survey we did was actually last summer. It was just like, hey, how messed up is your, is your situation, basically? Um, and there's more, more details than that. This one, we started to look specifically at attitudes towards WordPress um, within enterprise companies. And there's, there's, there's uh, good news and, and room for improvement, let's say. So, so I was actually surprised to find that 92% of those we surveyed in enterprise organizations had a positive impression of WordPress. I sort of had this presupposition in my head that people like, were like, you know, WordPress is Tinker Toys, we can't use it here, it's, it's insecure or whatever. But I think actually the truth is a lot of these people have had direct experience with WordPress outside of their day job and they know, it's actually pretty good. Um, so it's widely known and widely liked. Um, and 80% of them said WordPress is enterprise ready, um, which, you know, that's, everybody has their own definition of what enterprise ready means. But, but I, I, it, that seems to be like a positive uh, signal from can WordPress find adoption within these organizations or is it just gonna get like blocked at the door? Now, um, only 34% of that though strongly agreed with that statement. So there were a lot of people that were kind of a little bit wishy-washy in the middle, like, well, is WordPress enterprise ready? I somewhat agree with that. And I'll get into some of the reasons why in a second, but that's one of the key areas of opportunity, I think, for those of us who work in this space or who want to work in this space to focus on. Um, and 60% of them currently use WordPress somewhere in some capacity. And that's another piece that we'll talk about because the the way in which WordPress gets adopted is, you know, there's a kind of a maturity model that goes along with that in, in these uh, larger organizations. But this is like good initial findings. Um, the uh, recommendations sort of that the, the survey company uh, put together uh, for, for us around this were, you know, to focus on how WordPress, the first piece was to focus on WordPress 
connects into other really important systems like CRM, um, uh, how it can be customized to meet people's needs, um, how, it, how to do governance with WordPress, how to keep track of multiple sites and oversee things. That's a really big, important imperative. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the takeaway was, you know, people know about it, people like it, but they know that it doesn't do everything. And like, yes, there's a plugin for that, but there, uh, a lot of the plugins are not necessarily designed to integrate with these enterprise systems. So there's like, a, a, there, but there are actually a bunch of them. Like there's a really good Salesforce plugin, for example. Um, and so, you know, that, but that might not be as widely known. Um, another uh, uh, key thing was, again, um, highlight the fact that you can make really great uh, websites for these devices on WordPress too. Um, that's something that like, Enterprise organizations are increasingly realizing they're like behind the eight ball. Y'all remember uh, responsive design um, and how that, that was, the truth is that, is, that was not a really great uh, answer because responsive design is a incremental step of, well, the website will not look entirely broken on your phone uh, if you choose to wait for it to load. <laughs> um, uh, which is a step up from like, I can't read the, I'm, you know, I, uh, like this, but um, the reality is that over, uh, you know, I think over 50% of even in the US, web browsing uh, is done from mobile devices now. Um, and there is a significant difference in the outcomes you get uh, if that's a big part of your traffic, and not everyone is, uh, when you have an, a, a website that's optimized for a mobile device versus one that's simply responsive when it's loaded on a small screen. Um, so that's one thing. Um, uh, you know, th then there are other, other pieces they said you'd kind of have to figure out how to, to talk about alongside WordPress, which is like, again, speaking to some of those IT considerations around disaster recovery, you know, security, how do you, how do you make it all scale and so forth. Um, you know, to be considered an enterprise grade CRM, you would need, those would, those would sort of be um, um, table stakes type, type questions that people would ask. Um, and yeah, I sort of cover that in the, in the third piece as well. Um, so this all, it's, this is not terribly surprising to me. This, this makes sense. Like the, the, the through line is, you know, on the IT side, you were gonna need to shore up uh, WordPress uh, and explain that it, you know, um, even if you have a positive impression of it, you probably want some additional assurances around security. Um, you wanna know that you can handle the scale of the, the project that you're taking on and how you're gonna address that. And on the business user side, you, know, you wanna like really hit home that there's like real value in uh, building digital experiences this way because you can meet the, the expectations of modern digital native uh, consumers and constituents. Um, and also that like WordPress is a great way to tie together all these other pieces of technology that you're also working with. Um, and then this, to this other uh, point about how enterprise adoption happens. Um, it doesn't always happen in this linear path, like it's, you know, technology goes through a journey inside a large organization. But this is a, I'm gonna oversimplify for the sake of creating a simple narrative. You know, WordPress will of, often start off as a, as a point solution, right? It's, a, it's the classic use case is people still just turn to it when they need a blog. Why not? It's a great blog. Um, or but it's, or it's, a, it's some kind of microsite, right? Like uh, in the uh, Georgia Department of Education uh, story that they were talking about downstairs, it started out as a community forum, uh, as like a you know, quick, quick, let's get something up and running because we just had to shut down all the schools and the teachers need a way to talk to each other that we can verify is real. Um, and, uh, and share best practices. So point solution around a community forum, they got that up and running in a matter of weeks and, and it worked wonderfully for them. Um, now, and, I'm, and I, I swear I didn't plan it this way, they're, they're talking about being in the midst of relaunching the main Department of Education website on WordPress. It's currently running on SharePoint, so they need to do something. Um, but you know, uh, SharePoint served them well. I don't wanna just badmouth SharePoint. Um, but this is usually the next step, is right? you get to this no notion of like, we have an enterprise CMS, which is, you know, we feel like we can put flagship main brand properties, primary domains, and run these big websites, important websites on WordPress. And there's another stage beyond that that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, because this is what I think is really interesting for people who are, you know, people in the community, people um, 
you know, whether uh, you're a plugin developer or you're an agency person or, or someone else. What I've seen happen is organizations take this journey and move on to the point where they no longer consider, where they're thinking about WordPress as an enterprise-wide platform. They're not thinking about individual websites anymore. They're thinking about, we use WordPress to solve problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, this means um, leveraging WordPress across many projects and often in larger organizations through many different teams. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting and I think really um, uh, valuable uh, uh, implementation of open source technology. You kind of think of it like if you're a Linux person, this is like these enterprises are building their own WordPress distro and then making use of it internally uh, across a number of different projects and a number of different um, stakeholders. And I, I have a, an example of a customer of ours that did this. Um, it's a, a company called Pernod Ricard. They're uh, headquartered out of Paris, um, but they have a, uh, it's a holding company that owns, I think, uh, like 250 um, alcohol brands, including a bunch of brand names like Absolute Vodka and so forth. Um, and they, uh, we started working with them a, uh, like a while ago. I think it was 2015 or so, so forth. And they were at that stage in the, in the state that a lot of large companies are where, you know, a lot had happened, <laughs> they had been growing really fast, they'd done a lot of acquisitions, and as a result of that, they had this like totally chaotic landscape of technologies. Um, and they also had this world where the central IT team that ultimately was the bag holder for all of this was not empowered to set standards or, or provide guidance. Like they, they have you know, all these different brands and sometimes even the same brand within a different geography would just go out and hire their own agency because they have a campaign coming up and they need this website up and running and you know, if you're, you can't tell me no, I'm just gonna go do it. Um, because the dynamics in the business were such that IT just didn't have that kind, of, that kind of power. It was more decentralized. And so they were just really stuck because they, would, they had all, like this, this total cluttered pile of technologies um, and they were constantly getting new things thrown over to the wall at them because you know, um, it turns out that Ballantine's whiskey took off like a rocket in Poland and somebody local built 10 websites to support the different campaigns they did around them. And guess who owns that forever? Them. Um, and so we started working with them on developing a, um, a, a web platform that they could use to, um, you know, uh, not only to rationalize their existing project portfolio, but to get ahead of the needs of other people in their organization to say, look, you're gonna, you want a campaign site, here's how you'll do it. We use WordPress in this way. It comes pre-configured with all this stuff. We know how to maintain it long term. Um, and you know, over the course of many years, this was not like a project that happened overnight, but they got this really, really great uh, kit together. And you know, the central team now has like you know, two engineers that are supporting 225 plus sites, and they're happy about it. Uh, and they are working with all these other little stakeholders in the organization, and they can get a new campaign site spun up in an hour. Um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a tremendous success story for them. And this is a quote from um, the, the leader of the guy who helped this trans, uh, transformation to come about, you know, talking about how he arrived at the decision to go down this path. Um, you know, WordPress came out as a winner due to its affordable costs, the ease of content management, and the agency partner's expertise and experience. Our goal is to be flexible to different development styles. We didn't want to end up in a situation where the platform was unpopular amongst our many global agencies and teams. So they, they were able to strike a balance with WordPress where they had some amount of governance over the things, but they also let the, all the, the stakeholders do their own thing uh, to a certain extent. And um, I can tell you, you know, having worked with, with Ian for, for years, like, the, like <laughs> the mistakes were definitely made along the way. It wasn't perfect, but it was so much better, so much better than what they were dealing with before. Um, and that would not have been possible without, um, you know, the ability of, um, um, you know, the, the open source sort of core CMS um, to, 
you know, it's, it's not just actually the open source. That's the other thing that's great about WordPress that I, I didn't, I sort of alluded to um, in the why do large organizations care about it. But the popularity of Word, WordPress and the wide availability of expertise and talent around it is a huge selling point, especially when you consider that the other solutions that most of these organizations are considering are like enterprise only software that there's like 500 people on the planet that know how to implement, and 429 of them work for Accenture. It's like, kind of, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's tough, right? You, you're like, oh, I'm gonna get in the van. We'll, we'll get your implementation plan going. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, these DXPs. This is what the, the, the category is called in the industry. They're not really delivering the goods. Like this was something that really came up in the mid, um, the mid teens. Um, and it was the, based on this notion that there would be these, these all-in-one vendors that would give you everything you needed for your web experience. And that was not a silly thing to predict because it had happened in other software categories before. Like, you know, you look at what Salesforce did with, with CRM and that very successful doing that. Um, but there's two, two things I think that are different and really different about the web and the world that we inhabit, which is one, um, we're talking about user experiences at the end of the day. User experiences don't want to be commodified. Um, if you're thinking about your CRM and how you internally operate like your customer service or your sales team, you kind of actually do want that to be commodified. You want it to be the same. You don't mind if it's the same as like your competitor because like you want to be able to hire someone and like have them know how to uh, run the software right off the bat. And there's like best practices for how you do all those things that like, you know, you could tinker with a little bit, but it's mostly you just have to out hustle or have a better strategy than someone else. When you're talking about how you present yourself, your organization, your custom, your, your company to the world, you don't want to look like everybody else. You don't want to be, you want to be differentiated. Differentiation is how you get a competitive advantage. Um, the other thing that this, the, this uh, perspective, the DXP perspective totally missed was the, like, the MarTech 10,000. I think like at the time that the DXP emerged as a category, there were, it was the MarTech 2000 or the MarTech 500. Oh, okay, wow. Uh, Scott Brinker, uh, he really, he, he caught a tiger by the tail there. Um, so, and it's 10,000 now. Like the opposite is what happened. There was a Cambrian explosion of technologies, as I mentioned before, because there are all these new channels are emerging, new behaviors are emerging, and new technologies emerge to allow companies to try to capitalize on those opportunities. So the exact opposite of the consolidation happened. And so you have these companies that tried to build these all-in-one suites. That they, they're, some of them, are, they have good software, but the, 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 the paradigm they were trying to build toward was just fundamentally misaligned with the realities of what people need in the market. And so you can see it's like kind of starting to show up now as people are going through renewal cycles and saying, do I want to do this for another five years? And they're more and more often saying no, or I wouldn't recommend it. And open source vendors are starting to see more, you know, more positive uh, referrals. So I, I guess I should have explained the, explained the graph too. So the, this is uh, data taken from the Gartner Peer Insights Forum, which is a publicly available uh, review site that caters to enterprise users. So um, you can go in there and, and look it up and check it out yourself and check, you know, check your favorite vendor and see if they're on there and you can compare people and stuff like that, it's kind of cool. But if you just get the raw data and, um, and, uh, and graph it out, um, credit to Noel Pock for, for making this graph and posting it on LinkedIn so I didn't have to. Um, so this is our perspective. And get, get, getting back to the, 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 um, my professional per, uh, view on this, which is there was a notion that, that <clears throat> uh, large organizations would buy these monolithic suites from individual vendors that's just not turned out to be very, very good. It hasn't worked out for a lot of people. Instead, I think we're living in a world where you need to be able to compose a stack composed of you know, open source technologies and SaaS technologies. It's not gonna be all open source all the time um, for most folks, because it's a lot of overhead to manage. Um, and you know, I see WordPress, Drupal still uh, uh, used in a lot of cases, and I see that the, the rising generation of front end technologies, I think I've seen Next.js mentioned like five times just at this camp. Um, They've got a really, really awesome uh, approach to delivering even more zippy experiences, especially for these kinds of devices. Um, I think the future is gonna be in companies figuring out how they're gonna put together the right, uh, the right stack of technologies for them to do what they need to do. Uh, and, and I think WordPress is, it's not quite, quite like positioned that way in the graph, but like 
the, the, the CMS, the content management system, really is one of the most important hubs in that type of implementation. And, uh, and I think you know, uh, for, for enterprises and, and larger organizations, WordPress has a ton of value to offer in that context. And with that, I will stop monologuing and happy to answer questions that anybody has. Yes. Earlier you talked about your own personal view of WordPress back in the day. What gave you that impression? Uh, so So the question was, uh, I talked about um, my own perception of WordPress back in the day and what gave me that perception. Um, so I would say it was um, primarily driven by my own experience with WordPress in like circa 2002, 2003. Actually, I, I had a BB Press blog that I upgraded to WordPress. Um, and that was just, you know, you work with the technology once, you just kind of, that's, that's the, the data point you have in your head. And then I will also say, and the, the, this is something that I, I, is, is actually changed a lot and that's great. The like, sort of like, well, uh, we don't need to support the latest versions of PHP because we're WordPress and we, the rules, don't, like, you know, I don't want to for the, the kind of misalignment between PHP and its progression and WordPress that was happening in the later aughts um, that also, I think, contributed to my perception that it was like maybe not ready for prime time, um, fairly or not. I think those are both data points that put that in my head. Happy to say that's all been resolved. <laughs> yes. You were at one point talking about large organizations and uh, security, mm -hmm. and I've worked for a number of large corporations that deal with uh, insurance. There's a lot of security because of personally identifiable information and um, technology. They, they have a, you know, a tracking system that the developer, I'm a UX designer, so you, know, you work on scrum teams and there's sprints and everything. So you're talking, you say it takes too long to make changes, but they have to make these adjustments and changes and go through the testing and everything. Can you speak to, again, to those concerns about that very secure information? Do they have to have it where the changes are come up successfully in an audit to, you know, CYA, shall we say, um, when the uh, uh, regulators come in and uh, that the software changes and the, the scrum team yeah, yeah. So the question was, can you know, thinking of uh, the needs of security in uh, industries like finance, insurance, and healthcare, where there's like very, very sensitive information, um, and also um, the the reality that the um, even when you know engineering teams are using best practice agile methods, like that, the the uh, overhead of maintaining compliance with that type of security process is one of the reasons that some of that software might move slower. So it's kind of like speaking to security around information and also how security fits into um, a development practice. Um, it's two slightly different questions. Um, in my experience, I would never recommend using WordPress to store PII. I would, I would steer as very clear of that as a use case. I mean, it's, I should say sensitive PII, because if you're gonna have user accounts, there's gonna be email addresses in there, and you kind of have different grades of PII. It's just not a, uh, it hasn't been engineered with the notion of uh, that type of uh, information as what it's keeping track of. Um, you know, you would, you would want, and, and this is why in that kind of like diagram of the composable universe, um, there's a, uh, uh, you know, we uh, just uh, about to publish a uh, uh, Boston uh, healthcare, uh, the, uh, the hospital associated with Boston University uh, case study. And, and their whole point was we have a stack of technology that's for our web experiences that are public facing, and then we have Epic, which is where all it was our patient portal, which is all of our patient touch points. And we keep those very, very segmented and the handoff points between them are carefully managed. 
Um, so, so really there's like, on the, on the one hand, I, I would say, sometimes people think about this and like, oh, we can't use WordPress because we have, you know, um, this type of information that you wouldn't necessarily want to keep there. And the answer is like, well, you usually have multiple systems when you're dealing with that type of information. And I guarantee you that your epic is a terrible way to represent your organization to the public and inform them about things. So you can, you can work with both. And then to your point on uh, scrum teams and, you know, security testing and auditing, um, yeah, this is something that we, this is like, this is kind of my, my bread and butter as a, uh, a business person is trying to help bring WordPress development teams up to a lot of those standards. Because you, it, once you get a good DevOps kind of pipeline going, then you can layer in that additional sort of the DevSecOps. Like it's the automated security auditing, the, the code snapshotting, the ability to, uh, to, to provide like a, a, a chain of custody for every change that was made to the functionality of the website. And then on the WordPress side, uh, from that standpoint, when you're thinking about, you know, some of these demands are actually made of content teams. So like my, uh, my wife works for a pharmaceutical company and for certain things that they put on the website, they, they have the similar requirements because they're making representations about drugs. Um, and that's not something that, <laughs> that's not something you would necessarily, that, that's one of those cases where it's good to have those extra layers of checking before something goes live. But you can build all, like that's all just a matter of like, you know, roles, editorial workflow, and an audit log of who published what when. And then, like those are things that you can do in WordPress pretty easily. And that, like, you know, you just have to, you have to understand like, are you working with high velocity content or are you working with like, you know, very content you wanna be really careful about. And usually most, again, it's a mix, right? You're not always publishing the list of side effects for a drug. Sometimes you're just trying to get a, a post out in response to some, something that's happening in the news or, you know, take advantage of uh, something, you know, in a more marketing context. I hope that answered your question. So, the, 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 the segment, yeah, it, it can be hard when organizations are, are used to, um, uh, organizations still have a very monolithic mindset of like, it's the, the web has one, there's one tool that does all web. And it's like, that, that was true when there was a webmaster and that tool was, like tooling HTML on the server. It's like, no, you're gonna have lots of tools to do your web stuff. Uh, but they'll, they'll, they'll catch on eventually, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so following up on the first part of that question and then sort of going down the, the inner world future projections, we've all seen the experience of perfect example of the Chinese world between PII and medical, HIPAA compliant stuff, and marketing information, and there's been contexts where you're like, right, keep that Chinese wall, and then every once in a while, they want to try to tie a record. More and more, some of our clients are saying, we are going to do integrations with this composable stack, where this wall is starting to become porous. Do you see a future where Pantheon and companies like yourself are hosting in general will have to start looking at creating data structures that are more fluid for this composable stack. Because even in your, giving you some context, even in your slide where you show how composable the platform is, like clients want source of truth. So let's take out HIPAA stuff and say, if you just want to grab some stuff that's not so HIPAA from the HIPAA one and bring it so that it's available to those other Components, we need a place to do that, like a data library, so to speak, or a database that's not WordPress. Is that something that you think hosting companies like Pantheon may look at, or where will that look? Um, so, uh, I'll paraphrase the question uh, and tell me if I got it right. Um, in a world where, as, as always happens, like those clean lines of separation are, the business has reason to want to pass information back and forth or match records across those clean lines of separation. Is there a role for platform providers or hosting companies like Pantheon to play in helping to make that happen? Um, uh, I would say no. Um, and the reason I would say that is uh, the sorts of organizations that really have, so there's, there's cases where you have that need and it's pretty lightweight. 
in which case there are like customer data platforms are already a thing and they already help with all this stuff and they're really easy to implement and and like I wouldn't I don't want to I don't think we're going to get into a you know competing with segment um, as a as a way to start to 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 tie some of these things together and in cases where the use case is is like more um, significant and material um, I'd much rather partner with Google Cloud Platform on feeding data out of the publicly facing web side of the sphere into a data lake that, they're, that the company is building on top of BigQuery or something else that already exists. And I, I see it as more of a, a way of, um, in, in both of those cases, the role that I think I would play or we would play is in helping to like, architect the integration correctly and potentially guide people to the right partner. Right, but wouldn't you Double be the work. ones we would come to to work have to with pass. Google Data Lake and the So typically, in the, so the, wouldn't you come to us for doing that? Uh, we would get the conversation started, but the reason why larger scale organizations want to approach that type of uh, model is it's their Google Data Lake. They don't want it to be Pantheon's. They want it to be owned by them. Uh, and Amazon does similar things. We just aren't partnered with Amazon. Um, so like the idea is you, 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 you create a, a, a secure way to pass information from the Pantheon managed sphere of, uh, or WordPress managed sphere, it doesn't have to be on us, uh, of, uh, of data into a separate partition within the Google Cloud platform that's owned by the customer. And so like it's really their data at that point. Uh, and, and we're just helping to make sure that it, it gets dropped in the right place. Yep. Other questions? Awkward Zoom length pause. <laughs> Thank you very much.